Hi, this is Deb. Uh, I look into the feature store and machine mm -hmm. learning infrastructure teams at Eight Karma, and then I'll let Raj uh, go, go over his introduction. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Raj Katakam. I'm in uh, machine learning. I'm a machine learning engineer in the uh, in the team which uh, uh, Deb and Vishnu lead. So. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, here. Pro uh, I've been one of the founding members of this particular platform, so I've been here from 2018. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Deb and Raj. So uh, I'll try to breeze through some of the slides here. So what we really wanted to do was we wanted to talk a little bit about why we needed something like uh, Vega. And uh, Deb is then going to cover uh, what is Vega, and uh, Raj is going to go into like a, a deep dive of uh, how we do ML ops at Credit Karma and how we have built a lot of these things and how we use it for various uh, data science applications, and spend a little bit of time about some key takeaways in future work. Um, so why Vega? So just to introduce uh, Credit Karma to people over there. Um, so at Credit Karma, we champion uh, financial progress for more than 120 million members through a personalized experience. And all of this is uh, driven by data and models at scale. Uh, when I joined the company in 2014, I've been here for uh, close to eight years now. And uh, we were doing models at that point of time. And when I joined the company, I was uh, definitely uh, happy to see that we were doing a lot of models and using a lot of models in uh, production. But we had a lot of challenges and uh, our use cases kept growing along the way. So I'm going to cover a little bit of that in the next slide. Uh, so when it comes to models, uh, essentially what we try to do is uh, we want to recommend financial products to our uh, members. That's the offer marketplace that you want to see on the right. And we want to make sure that we are recommending the right financial content uh, to our members so they're able to uh, look at their financial progress. They are able to understand what is going to help them make meaningful financial progress and then uh, use the content in an appropriate way for their own lives in, a, in their own way. And we are also using emails as a critical mechanism to reach out to our 120 million members and keep them updated about what's going on with respect to their financial progress. We understand that uh, not everyone has the time to keep coming to the app and checking in on everything that's going on. So we want to keep them updated with respect to what's going on with their uh, financial lives. And all, or pretty much all of this is powered by models and uh, we're going to spend some time talking about that. So uh, let me try to just like uh, uh, script through some of the transitions here. So like I mentioned, when we started, when I started in 2014, we were already doing, uh, answering this important question of what offers can members get? So uh, when I say offers, I mean credit cards or personal loans. It could be a Amex Platinum or it could be some personal loan from Lending Club or Prosper or one of these other institutions. So we wanted to make sure that our members have high certainty in what offers that they are able to get. And that's been our bread and butter. That's been a big part of our offering for our members over, over the last eight and even much longer than that. Uh, so that's something that we had been doing all the time. And uh, starting 2016, we started getting more ambitious. We wanted to start looking at what offers do the members want and not just what can they what they can get. Then we also wanted to start uh, leveraging machine learning in improving our uh, member engagement. And think about it. So we have, when I say we have 120 million members, these are 120 million members who's, uh, who are verified and validated to be real members with financial records and financial progress. And this is not, uh, uh, this is not like a, a Twitter bot or whatever. So we don't have Elon Musk coming after us. Uh, so then we started getting into understanding a sense of how we can improve uh, a member lifetime value. And we also wanted to start getting a sense of how we can help understand our members better so that we can help them. And we started getting into things like what, what, what could be the members borrowing power. So we got, start giving them a sense of like what their borrowing power is. And finally, we wanted to, as the number of items and number of, uh, things that we can recommend to our members started growing, we needed to start getting more uh, sophisticated about how we do find relevant items uh, for a member. 
um and uh, and pretty much in the last uh, couple of years uh, given credit karma has gone into checking and savings and other uh, banking products that we make available for our members we really needed to up our game in terms of understanding how to deal with uh, fraudulent transactions to protect our members and our business so that i would say if you can think about it right so we've had like this evolution of personalization over the years and we de- really needed the infrastructure to be able to support everything that we were building here and uh, pretty much the common denominator is usage of machine learning models in in solving all of these problems that we had in front of us and uh, before uh, this i i'm not going to spend way too much time on this but the way to think about it is like uh, before we started working on vega we had a lot of different manual steps there were a lot of different tools we were not yet ident- we had not yet identified the stack that we were going to work on so and we had a lot of challenges in scaling pretty much every single thing that we talk about here uh, and over the years we've tried out uh, and we uh, identified like bigquery as something that we wanted to use we spent a little bit of time working on apache spark and we still use apache spark in some areas but uh, pretty much a lot of the machine learning stuff that we want to talk about here is on uh, beam and uh, dataflow I want to just quickly run through some of this. So, essentially, the way to think about it is: Why did we need to scale ML Ops, right? So, we needed to scale ML Ops because our members member base kept growing. Uh, we were like, when I joined the company, we were around 20, 25 million members. Our member base kept growing, and it's like around 120 million. uh the amount of data that we have about our members also kept growing i remember when i joined the company we were only transunion and uh, we used to get data from transunion on behalf of our members in over the years we have added equifax as well and made sure that all of the data is available for uh, our models uh, so the data kept growing our member base kept growing so the amount of data that we needed to deal with just kept growing uh and then we also like i talked about earlier we also wanted to solve a lot of these different use cases and we needed to be smart about making sure that we are using our data science time well and that's where like the model development and refresh needed to become more efficient and we needed to make sure that we were uh, maximizing the time of our data scientists and that's where like even the model deployment and monitoring in com- uh, comes up as well um and uh, once we started having different data science teams dealing with different challenges we needed we wanted to make sure that we were standardizing a bunch of the stuff and that's where a big part of ml ops comes in with that i'm going to hand over to deb so that he can cover what is vega yeah thanks a lot vishnu uh, just want to ensure that are we all audible uh so i uh, we we don't see the screen from the austin so are we all okay if it is then i'm going to uh, go over like what really vega is so vega is our model development kit which was written in python and the whole idea was to have an unified framework that we can come up with for building features to build the training data and then also build models and deploy them So I'll go a little bit details about what are the design principle we had with Vega. So one of the things that we f- focused on is to make use of open source standard, and that's where Beam comes into play. So we wanted to kind of build it on top of Beam, something that is open where uh, we can contribute to the community. And then we we also focused on TensorFlow because TensorFlow was also an open source project, and then. for other open source tools kits like apache airflow now because we chose the beam the whole idea was that we wanted to leverage google cloud and that that's where dataflow and beam connection comes into play so we wanted to ensure that we can scale our machine learning uh, as our services scale so we may made use of dataflow to connect with the beam api we also use the other gcp hosted services like ai platform cloud composer and then the third pillar was that that how we want to ensure to come up with an unified ml workflows for all our data scientists so 
uh, think about is the common pre-processing steps, uh, the model scoring, model analysis for all frameworks, right? Scikit, TensorFlow, XGBoost, LightGBM. We wanted to come up with a unified framework that was written using Beam, and all data science can make use of that. And we gave access to the state-of-the-art machine learning algorithm with this framework. And uh, we also wanted to have this Python APIs that data scientists can call from notebook where our Apache Beam local runner actually came into play that they could sample the data, make use of local runner from notebook, and then they can de deploy it using the data flow. And then uh, the fourth pillar that we were focusing is that, that uh, how do we make use of efficient ML engineering? And then we wanted to have the interactive and cloud run and end-to-end -end data science process and also the workflow where we can deploy these in an automated way. Uh, so in terms of the training component, uh, we supported feature engineering at a high level that makes use of Apache Beam, both Python API and Scala APIs. Then we had model training where in model training, we have modeling ETL. That's where also Dataflow and Beam comes into play. And then we make use of Beam heavily for the model pre-processing, come up with the pre-processing graph then that we attach with the model. And then as when we get into the model, we need to backscore the model, find out all the holdout data, send, send the holdout data to backscore the model, find out all the offline metric. So all that logic also is written using Apache Beam. Oh, so it seems like Vishnu's slides are getting shared. Uh, okay. So after model an analysis, I think the refresh infrastructure is where uh, we make use of Apache Airflow. Air 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 now, if you wish to, if you go to the next one, uh, I think, uh, and, and, uh, and then on the serving side, uh, we make use of, uh, we, we have a model scoring service that is built using TensorFlow and JPM, Java PMML scoring. We, we are not going to go too much detail into this, but also for model mo monitoring, we make use of Dataflow and Beam, uh, Beam to set up the model monitoring that we have. And then, of course, we make use of our uh, many different tools like Slack, PagerDuty, New Relic, Splunk to, to get the results of the model monitoring and uh, alert our data scientists. In this talk, we are not going into too much detail about model scoring. If you go to the next slide. So uh, from this, I'll let Raj cover the MLOps deep dive. Uh, we should still check if we are still visible in Austin. Uh, yeah, I, 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 my screen seems to be uh, muted as well. I don't know, am I audible? Yes, I can he he hear you, Raj, but no, I'm not no, sure I, if Austin. Yeah, I don't okay. think anybody from Austin is also in this chat, though. Oh, so in, in this call, though. Uh, let's see. Not sure if, should, if we should continue. Yeah, I think maybe they dropped off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, good. Got it. Cool. So, okay, so I can continue. Uh, so I, I'll start with basic, my objective in this particular section is to give a top level of how DS writes their experimentation and production workflows about using Vega, right? So as a refresher, I want to give you like, you know, what Vega is, like Vega is nothing, uh, I, I, if, if you break it down, if you break down Vega into, into smaller building blocks, so Vega is a combination of multiple processors. For each individual task, you have a processor. Like if if you were if 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 you want to 
uh, do some uh, actions on queries, like you know, using queries or SQL transformations, then you have query processor. You have pipeline processor for Python UDFs and Python transformations, or like you know, that is powered by Dataflow, Python Dataflow. And then you have one processor if you would, I mean, if you want to create estimators. Uh, then that is powered by AI platform. And then you have Scala processor. This is also powered by Dataflow, but now you are using uh, Java, Java B for uh, writing your transformations. So when, uh, so if I consider a data science journey, so basically they come to the black, they come on Vega they, uh, and write a bunch of uh, processors. And, and each processor, mind you, is like, you know, uh, in a, is an entity in itself, so you can you can run it in an interactive fashion. So uh, once you are happy with the experimentation by running things interactively, you can within two lines of code, with just two lines of code, you can compile these processes into an uh, into a production airflow workflow. So this reduces the gap between production and experimentation. So if I were to take like you know. Uh, the, from from those building blocks, if I were to take uh, a group of tasks where we use Beam extensively, then I can actually divide those into three. That is model building, then you have batch inference and model monitoring. So in the next set of slides, I'll go over a few examples which describe how we use Vega to accomplish these tasks. Right. So. So as I said, query processor, we actually in the model building piece, you just are giving some, uh, you, if you just feed some queries and uh, with with some parameters, you can uh, like, you know, do those uh, query transformations. In this example, you are just doing upsampling and downsampling, uh, a simple upsampling and downsampling, but I don't want to go more into this. Let's go to the second one, which is Scala UDF. So most of our, uh, in 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 great karma, most of our microservices are in uh, uh, are are in uh, are Scala based microservices. So if if you have a Scala UDF transformations, uh, you uh, uh, it's it, it gets very easy to write a lot of data uh, ETLs with from which on logs from these live services, right? So uh, one such transformation which data science and we do a lot is we tap onto this we tap onto the recommendation services logs and then we extract like you know uh, all the predictions which and all the offers which the user has seen and then try to run some lot of analytics on it. In this example, uh, I'm just showing you a simple example and how the, how we are enabling this. We have abstracted out all the setup pieces and everything. And we only expose a simple UDF like this where data science can come in and write like, you know, uh, transformations. In this example, you are just, uh, it's a, a small example where uh, we are just converting null strings to zero strings. So all of that is like, you know, Scala processes. So the next piece in this uh, model building, uh, where in this model building where we use Dataflow a lot is TensorFlow transform section. So by in once we have it, once we are training data, each data scientist has their own set of uh, pre-processing, right? So like you know before they feed the data to estimators. So some some, some data scientists would want to normalize with min-max, some some of them would want to do standard scale uh, standard scalar or like you know z-score transformations. It's your world is your playground for all the transformations in this particular section. So if uh, here I'm just showing you a simple example where you're imputing NANDs with zeros. So the advantage by using TensorFlow transformations is basically that you can compile a graph and you can attach this graph while you are uh, uh, like you know while you're serving online so that these transformations need not be replicated in any other language and they can be combined with estimator as such in all in terms of the ecosystem. So one another big use case which where we use uh, a, uh, where we use Beam a lot is model chaining. In this example, so like you know, uh, so uh, to reduce the latency and not to keep the user waiting to get best items he's eligible for, we divide the like you know model building pieces into into like you know uh, into a chain. So we chain complex models to the live models. In this example, like you know, 
the top one is basically a complex model which is trained on 90 days worth of data and it is quite huge so the uh, whereas the bottom one is lightweight neural network which is like you know trained uh, let's say daily versus the one which is on the top is trained by weekly so basically uh, basically like you know you are reducing your uh, uh, you are reducing your latencies and also you are like you know optimizing your model building time by uh, by by dividing this into two multiple pieces two pieces and you can chain we are chaining these two in uh, uh, in tensorflow uh, in ten, using tensorflow transform in apache v right so then comes the important piece that is the batch inference. So here also beam plays an important part. So uh, at CK we score chunk of TensorFlow models and they need to be scored on a data set which is extremely huge. So think of it like this, right? So you have 120 million pros, uh, like you know, a plethora of items. So if you see that cross the data set is quite huge and we would want to get uh, batch inferences and all of this. So that's a quite heavy job. So what we have seen is that if we were to score one model at a time in a loop, then that is extremely costly. So what we do is we take all the models with same input features, we merge them together and get a combined graph. And this has shown to be like, you know, uh, proven to be extremely like, you know, powerful in terms of uh, uh, performance. So, and then uh, obviously, uh, the exactly like TensorFlow models, we have a scoring requirements for PMML models as well. And the scale at which we operate for PMML models is also very similar to TensorFlow models. Since Python is best suited for data science and is iterable very uh, and, and iterations on Python is quite fast as compared to like, you know, Scala. So we want to provide an interface, we, pro we want to provide uh, uh, an interface where uh, data science can write and score PMML models as well in Python. So that is the reason why, whereas like, you know, in, in, in data flow workers and all, you don't get JVM already installed. So we have, uh, what we have done is we have packaged a set of tasks where, where basically you are just copying JVM on each individual worker. And we are installing this particular pack, Python package as, uh, one of the requirements for data flow, data flow setup. So this enables you to actually run uh, PM and score PMML models on Python data flow. So this has proven to be extremely like, you know, powerful in terms of uh, like, you know, the usage of Vega and also the ease at which you are iterating for data science. So, and then uh, once you have the model building pieces, I just wanted to like, you know, just to kind of close the dots, just show you how this data science writes their estimators as well, but we need not go much deep into it. The next piece, once we have uh, like, you know, all the models uh, ready, uh, we want to the, we want to do automatic auto model refresh, right? So this is, this particular piece is the game changer. So, uh, once the model is like, you know, released and then like, you know, is put into production, we want to cater to the seasonal changes which happen, uh, like, you know, after it has released. So we want to automatically refresh the models on the latest data and update it if it, it, it uh, like, you know, goes through some of the model metrics and it performs better than the previous one. So in this example, we are, uh, uh, like, you know, here we are showing uh, uh, a simple, uh, uh, here on the left, you have a simple customization where data science can write what metric they want to monitor the model on. And towards the right is your <clears throat> is one of the alerts where a model has been refreshed using log loss. So all of this is also done in uh, Beam and using Vega where you are, they are just plugging in uh, their pieces of code and metrics for getting the best model out and refreshing it automatically without actually any user be in the loop, oh, without actually uh, it having any engineer in the loop per se, right? So, and in the last piece where Beam and then Dataflow plays an important piece is model monitoring. So 
So DS has the capability to define alerts and uh, alerts on models in production. And towards the left is your average precision uh, uh, average precision scores. This is checked every couple of hours, so like you know you can customize that as well. And towards the right is the stability checks for those input features. So if you see like you know these kind of alerts tell give us helps us take actions like here. Uh, uh, what model monitoring enables you uh, enables is basically like you know if if feature distributions have changed as compared to what it was during training then it it would uh, then it's a clear indication that you are either you have to either refresh the model or there might be something wrong in your pipeline so yeah so now that we have uh, seen all the individual blocks this is one example where all of these uh, processes are coming together. Uh, data science. This one example is, is is an example where data science has written all these processes and compiled a DAG and then uh, like you know uh, 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 productionized it. So uh, so you can see that you can visualize that basically the gap between experimentation and production is extremely low because of all of this and there was. And all of this process is self-serve without having any engineer in the in the loop. So that's for Vega. So now I want to like you know go over data science applications. Uh, like you know how we are powering. Uh, what kind of applications are we powering by using this uh, uh, Vega, right? So one is email campaigns. So here, like you know. You see, like you know, we we are developing emails to uh, our 120 million users, and depending on the content, so it, depending on the content which uh, is sent to the user in the email, like you know, uh, user or user chooses to open it, and if he opens it, he op he goes to the landing page, and on the landing page, he has uh, he can select the offer, and if and he can choose to apply for the offer or not. So, like, if you see the whole pipe, whole funnel, each individual step is an action as an action associated with it. And we have models for, like, you know, each individual action per se. So, something very sim uh, on a similar ground, like, you know, Credit Karma has a of content catered for the user. Like, you know, a couple of content examples would be like, let's say, if we figure out that you're overpaying your uh, uh, overpaying and you have an option to reduce your uh, or consolidate your debt then we have a we have stories on that particular grounds and if your insurance is too high you have stories on those particular grounds so based on the user's financial profile and like you know uh, where he's standing in terms of his journey so like you know uh, there are different bunch of models which can which can show you the right uh, financial content and right set of stories. So in this example, like, you know, uh, th there are three stories and you have like, you know, uh, and, uh, and the funnel for those is basically like whenever you see that particular story, there is a probability that you can, you would click on it. And if you click on it, how much value is it delivering per se? So we have models for all of those and all of those are also powered by Vega. Something very similar for offers as well. So when you see cards or loans, then you have a probability for click. You and then there is a probability once you have clicked, when you have a probability for applying, and then once you have uh, applied, there is a probability that you get converted. And each individual step in this particular funnel is like you know are, are powered by Vega machine learning models per se. So so. So as initially how uh, initially Vishnu has introduced us to the pre Vega world, right? So now after Vega, so we have around 20x more features because this actually Vega Vega makes your feature engineering easy as well with a bunch of transformations it can provide, right? And then uh, there are more than 700 models which are deployed weekly and with and uh, with manual and with manual refresh as compared to manual refreshes in 2018 and, uh, and uh, below, right? And then uh, you have 7x more velocity for data science. So as compared to what we, we were seeing in 2018 per se. So that's from the applications perspective. So now what are the takeaways from all of 
from uh, Bean perspective, what we have seen is that, like, you know, customized Python packagement for, so we are running all of this uh, ecosystem in our own VPC. So we don't have connections with uh, external ecosystem. So we have like, you know, customized package management for all of our Bean jobs. And then uh, uh, like, you know, we, have, uh, we are contributing to the Dataflow community as well. And we have found like, you know, a couple of uh, interesting things since all of these Bean work for Python, for Python Dataflow, all of these workers don't have JVM installation. And we have, we had use cases where if we had JVM installation, it was like, you know, uh, quite useful. So we kind of figured out a way around it to put JVM and then make it ready for uh, uh, Python data flow users as use cases as well. And uh, what we have seen is basically if we were to do batch inferences, if we combine a bunch of models together and then uh, score all of them at once, score the big combined graph at once, that gives you a lot of performance boost. So, and, and like, you know, uh, fr coming from model analysis perspective, we have, uh, uh, we have a lot of transformations which allow you to do sklearn, uh, sklearn functions inside Beam uh, aggregations and they have found to be extremely useful for data science and extremely friend friendly to use from that particular se uh, section. So what are we planning? In, in the next, like, you know, in, in, in coming quarters is that we want to, like, you know, right, since this, since this whole Vega started, uh, we have been on uh, old versions. So we want to, like, you know, upgrade. There are, like, you know, a bunch of efforts going on in that particular direction. And uh, right now, we are not heavily using Python UDF for feature engineering, whereas uh, uh, we have plans to do that. And what we have found in the initial stages is that TensorFlow data validation and TensorFlow model analysis were doing way more, way more, and then like you know had uh, uh, had some uh, uh, performance of uh, performance uh, problems, and so we had to go and write uh, our own versions of this game. So now we are now I don't think we have all of those problems anymore. So we are kind of moving towards integrating all of those. So uh, that's uh, yeah, and so that's the, those are the key takeaways. So yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully this uh, talk was fun, and uh, yeah, we are hiring. If 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 anybody is interested, if anybody is, please do hit on to those previous page.